This week on The Communicators, a look at cell phone privacy and a Senate hearing this past week about reports that Google and Apple smartphones may be tracking the location of users without their knowledge. Well, this week saw the first ever congressional hearing on phone tracking. The Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Privacy, Technology and the Law held a hearing on protecting mobile privacy. That's our topic this week on The Communicators. Joining us is Paul Kirby, Senior Editor at Telecommunications Reports. Mr. Kirby, were Apple and Google on the hot seat in this hearing this week? They were on the hot seat. There have been a lot of reports recently in particular about Apple about them collecting location information and how that information is used and there had been a lot of controversy. A lot of members of Congress both in the House and Senate had written letters and so uh, they were on the hot seat with Senator Franklin, Al Franklin, the, the new uh, chairman of this, this new committee. It's a, called the Privacy Subcommittee. Um, so they kind of had to answer questions about what, what their practices are and what they do and what they don't do. And who discovered that these uh, smartphones were capable of doing this? Well, I mean, the the companies would say the, the quote-unquote discovery was something that occurred all along. It's just there were some researchers recently that, that realized that tracking goes on. The Wall Street Journal had also written some stories about tracking uh, and what the location information is used for. So members of Congress until really a few weeks ago didn't seem to have any knowledge of this. Um, the companies say, well, this is the information is used for a lot of services that consumers want. They want to be able to know where the nearest McDonald's is, or they want to be able to know where their kids are when they have their phones. And um, the question is, how is the, how's the information used, and, and do consumers know it's being used? And one of the things that this hearing showed, as well as some other letters to Congress recently, is there are a lot of players in the ecosystem. And uh, not all of them fall under any particular law, as, as the senator pointed out in his opening statement. There really are no laws that cover all of this um, location-based information. Well, let's look at uh, Al Franken's opening statement. Now, today in this hearing, we're looking at a specific kind of really sensitive information that I don't think we're doing enough to protect, and that's data from mobile devices, smartphones, tablets, cell phones. This technology gives us incredible benefits. Let me, let me say that. Let me repeat that. It, this technology gives us incredible benefits. It allows parents to see their kids and wish them good night, even when they're halfway around the world. It allows a lost driver to get directions, and it allows emergency responders to locate a crash victim in a matter of seconds. But the same information that allows those responders to locate us when we're in trouble is not necessarily information all of us want to share all the time with the entire world. And yet, reports suggest that the information on our mobile devices is not being protected in the way that it should be. In December, an investigation by the Wall Street Journal into 100, 101 popular apps for iPhone and Android smartphones found that 47 of those apps, 47, transmitted the smartphone's location to third-party companies, and that most of them did this without their users' consent. Three weeks ago, security researchers discovered that iPhones and iPads running Apple's latest operating system were gathering information about loser, uh, users' locations, uh, uh, location up to 100 times a day, and storing that information on the phone or tablet and copying it to every computer that the device is synced to. Soon after that, the American public also learned that both iPhones and Android phones were automatically collecting certain location information from users' phones and sending it back to Apple and Google, even when people weren't using location applications. In each of these cases, most users had no idea what was happening, and in many of these cases, once users learned about it, they had no way to stop it. These breaches of privacy can have real consequences for real people. A Justice Department report based on 2006 data shows that each year over 26,000 adults are stalked through the use of GPS devices, including GPS devices on mobile phones. That's from 2006 when there were a third as many smartphones as there are today. Paul Kirby. Well, I mean, he makes some interesting points. Um, again, a lot of it is Congress uh, doesn't keep up with the technology uh, kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, 
And, and what they do, what Congress does, usually follows kind of the technology. So in this case, and he pointed out in, at the hearing that the current laws really aren't set up for location-based services. I mean, there are laws adopted in the 1980s, for instance, and 1990s that are really now out of date. Um, so the senator and others, as well as some House members, have talked about legislation that would cover location-based services and, and more, more um, widespread um, security legislation uh, data privacy legislation that would say if there's a breach, um, not just on location-based services but other services, um, they have to notify people. Right now, states around the country, more than 40 states, have laws like that, but there's no national framework. And so at the hearing yesterday, there were representatives of Justice, the, the Federal Trade Commission, that talked about the need for that kind of legislation. And so uh, the uh, d representatives from the federal government did did all agree that some kind of federal law is needed? Yes, they did. What was the mood from other members of the committee? Um, I would say the mood was, was similar. Um, the, uh, the chairman of the full committee, Senator Leahy, was also made some comments that were similar to Senator Franken's, and that is, Basically, we need to update things. He said, for instance, Senator Leahy, that he's working on an update of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Um, that was legislation adopted about 15 years ago that, again, before we had location-based services. Um, so I think there are a lot of similar uh, comments made um, to Senator Franken's. Um, I wanted to ask about one thing Senator Franken said in his opening statement, transmitting data and information to third parties. Who are those third parties? Well, the third parties can be, um, there are a lot of in the, people say the wireless ecosystem, but you have applications, and the applications are downloaded f by people onto their phones. But there are a lot of companies that might be involved in helping create those applications or actually applications developers to make extra revenue or carriers to make extra revenue or companies that manufacture operating systems to make extra revenue could transmit that data to other people for marketing purposes. So for instance, um, uh, again, a lot of the location-based services try to focus on uh, making money off where people are. So, for instance, people always say, if you're walking past the Starbucks, you'll get a coupon on your phone saying, oh, come in and get a latte, that kind of thing. Um, the question is, who gets this information and do you, are you giving consent to it? The problem is the applications developers and, and operating system people, they're not, they don't fall under the laws like carriers do. For instance, the Federal Communications Commission has laws that govern carriers. And before carriers can take identifiable information of a person and use it for any pur commercial purpose, they have to get the permission of that, purpose, of that, of that person. But um, operating system makers, as well as applications developers, they don't fall under that regime. So there are a lot of parties here. And as he said at that hearing, um, you can have someone sell it to someone, sell it to someone, sell it to someone. And, and the, the, the consent issue is also a complicated one. How do you ask for consent? Is it opt-in or opt-out? How do you do that on a little small screen? Do you do it each time? Or as, as the senator and others said, or is it the end of a, of a nine-page privacy agreement that people just click through and say yes, and they, not, they didn't actually read it? Well, one of the testifiers yesterday was Bud Tribble from Apple. And here's an exchange he had with Senator Franken. Last month, I, I asked Apple in a letter why it was uh, building a comprehensive location database on iPhones and iPads and storing it on people's computers when they synced up, up of course. Apple's reply to my letter will be added to, to the record. But this is what Apple CEO Steve Jobs said to the press, quote, we build a crowdsourced database of Wi-Fi and cell tower hotspots, but those can be over 100 miles away from where you are those are not telling you anything about your location, end quote. Yet in a written statement issued that same week, Apple explained that this very same data will, quote, help your iPhone rapidly and accurate, accurately calculate its location. Or as the Associated Press summarized it, the data help the phone figure out its location, Apple said. But Steve Jobs, the same week, said, those are not telling you anything about your location. Mr. Tribble, it doesn't appear to me that both these statements could be true at the same time. Um, so Senator, this data, I, uh, does this data, I understand you're anticipating my question, so I'll just ask it and then you'll answer. Okay. Uh, does this data indicate anything about your location or doesn't it? Um, 
Senator, the data that's stored in the database is the location of as many Wi-Fi hotspots and cell, uh, cell phone towers as we can have. That data does not actually contain in our databases any customer information at all. It's completely anonymous. It's only about the cell phone towers and the Wi-Fi hotspots. However, when a portion of that database is downloaded onto your phone, your phone also knows which hotspots and cell, tone, cell uh, phone towers it can receive right now. So the combination of the database of where are those towers and hotspots, plus your phone knowing which ones it can receive right now is how the phone figures out where it is without the GPS. Well, right after that, the, the senator asked one of the other witnesses, who is a, a private consultant who worked with the Wall Street Journal on their series and has worked for various companies, and worked at the FTC at one time, does this information let them locate cell phones? And he said basically the data can locate devices quite accurately. Apple in its statement uh, in April said, in some cases we're talking about cell towers 100 miles away. He said, yeah, maybe in rural areas, but in urban areas we're talking about really quite pinpointed accuracy. So that's the concern. Now, um, again, Apple and others would say, yes, but if people want these services, how are they going to get these services if we don't know where they are? But then there's the concern. People are worried. And Apple says, we don't track our customers. But the concern is, is that there, the information is out there to do such a thing if, if someone wanted to. And that's, that's the, the concern. Well, Paul Kirby, you were referring to Ashkan Sultani, an independent consultant, uh, a telecommunications consultant. And here is what he had to say, basically what you just said. But here's the clip. Mr. Sultani, tell me, whose location is it? <laughs> is it accurate? Is it anonymous? Can it be tied back to individual users? Thank you, Senator. I think that's a great question. Um, so yeah, in, in many cases, this, the, the location that this, the, this data refers to is actually uh, the location of your device or somewhere near it. Um, while it's true that in some rural areas, uh, this can be up to 100 miles away. In, in practice, for the average customer it, or the average consumer, it's actually much closer, um, in the order of about 100 feet, according to uh, a, a, a developer of this technology, Skyhook. Um, if you if you refer to Figure Three of my testimony, um, you can see an example of this of this location as identified uh, uh, by one of these Wi-Fi geolocation databases. Um, I, I, I took my location based on GPS and um, my location based on the strongest nearby Wi-Fi signal in the Senate lobby, just, just out here. And the dot on the left refers to my location as determined by uh, exact GPS. And then the, the dot on the right um, determines my location based on uh, uh, this Wi-Fi this, this wi geolocation technology. And it was about 20 feet from where I was sitting on the bench. So, you know, depending on how you want to slice it, I would consider that my location. Um, in, in the, 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 the files in these databases also contain uh, timestamps that describe um, at what point I encountered some, some of these Wi-Fi access points, so they could be used to trace a, a kind of a, a trail about you. Paul Kirby, what are timestamps? I mean, I think that what timestamps are, they basically show where the phone was at a particular time. So a person could use that to, to find out where you were now. Someone that might be interested in that is law enforcement, and law, enf law enforcement purposes for location data came up at the hearing as well. But uh, law enforcement might use that to find out, let's say they were pursuing a criminal, to see where that, inf where that phone was at a given time, the assumption being you're holding the phone and, and that's where it was. Paul Kirby, is this big business for these uh, cell phone manufacturers, this uh, tracking ability? Well, not really for the manufacturers as much. I mean, they, they, they make the phone. The big business, the carriers make a lot of money off of it. The, the carriers, some of these applications, uh, the, the phones have the capability, and some of the applications are marketed through the carrier. And in others, um, the carriers and the cell phone makers have these app stores, and you can go and buy these apps, and then they get a cut of those. Um, so there's a lot of money being made by, by the app stores. There's a lot of money be, being made by some of the carriers, as well as the people who make the operation, uh, the operating systems. Uh, the, it was interesting the hearing the uh, one of the witnesses talked about the uh, the market for apps is growing so much. Um, this was Jonathan Zuck. He's president of the Association for Competitive Technology, uh, and he pointed out that the market um, basically is a couple billion dollars now, but it could 
it could go up to like $50 billion in not too many years. I mean, that's how much the, the apps market. The chairman of the FCC, Jen, uh, Chairman Janikowski, points out that just a few years ago, there was no thing as app stores. And now there are hundreds of thousands of apps, for instance, in Apple's store. So it's just exploded. Well, did anyone defend the practice of geo-tracking on the, on the cell phones, and can you turn them off? Did anyone on the committee Yeah, there was that? a lot of discussion about turning them off, and both Apple and, uh, and Google said you can, t first of all, they're saying that you have to give your consent to turn on, but yes, you, they, they both said you can turn it off relatively easily, that tracking capability. And again, the tracking, they don't like the word tracking, because then it makes it like you're track your movements for some purpose, but they, they did talk, as, as did Jonathan Zuck, about people want these applications. I mean, they're not being forced to download these applications, they're paying for them. And whether it's GPS or whether it's uh, applications that allow a person to know where their kid is, or if it's applications to, um, for, ser for coupons or things like that for stores, I mean, they're very popular applications. Well, Google was also represented by Alan Davidson, Director of Public Policy. Here's a little bit of what he had to say. Here's how it works. When I first took my Android phone out of its box, one of the initial screens I saw asked me, in plain language, to affirmatively choose whether or not to share location information with Google. A screenshot of this process is included in our testimony and on the board over here. If the user doesn't choose to turn it on at setup, or doesn't go into their settings later to turn it on, the phone will not send any information back to Google's location servers. If they opt in, the user opts in, all location data that is sent back to Google's location servers is anonymized and is not traceable to a specific user or device. And users can later change their mind and turn it off. Beyond this, we require every third-party application to notify users that it will be accessing location information before the user installs the app. The user has the opportunity to cancel the installation if they don't want information collected. We believe that this approach is essential for location services. Highly transparent information for users about what is being collected, opt-in choice before the location information is collected, and high security standards to anonymize and protect information. Our hope is this, that this becomes a standard for the broader industry. We are doing all this because of our belief in the importance of location-based services. Many of you are already experiencing the benefits of these services, things as simple as seeing real-time traffic, transit maps to aid your commute, finding the closest gas station on your car's GPS. And it's not just about convenience. These services can be lifesavers. Mobile location services can help you find the nearest hospital or police station. They can let you know where to fill a prescription at one in the morning for a sick child. And we've only scratched the surface of what is possible. For example, Google is working with the National Center for Missing and, Ex Missing and Exploited Children to explore how to deliver Amber Alerts about missing children to those in the vicinity of the alert. And mobile services may soon be able to tell people in the path of a tornado or tsunami or guide them in an evacuation, to an evacuation route in the event of a hurricane. Mr. Kirby? As he pointed out, there are a lot of safety applications for these, and the representative from the Department of Justice pointed out that it can be used, while Senator Franken talked about stalking and things like that and domestic violence, that the, the concern would be that someone who wants to do harm to some uh, a wife or husband, something like that, can use it. Uh, the technology can also be used to find those people who might be doing the stalking, the, the Department of Justice person pointed out. So, I mean, there are a lot of applications that can be helpful, and of course, Location accuracy is, is used by enhanced 911 and 911 services. Now, those, the way that works is it's assumed that you, uh, you don't have to give your permission for that to be used for that, but the, the, location, the location of your phone is important in terms of if you have an emergency and call 911 as well. Uh, now, Paul Kirby, can you opt in and opt out at will? Well, as far as um, getting your location tracked? Well, it depends. I mean, for instance, app, what they're hearing, they said they have an opt-out policy. So basically, um, you can opt out of, basically, it, it, it'll be collected unless you opt out of it. Alan Davidson said it's opt-in. So he said Google's is opt-in. So it, it won't be collected unless you opt in it, into it being collected. However, there are other issues, and that is, and some of the senators pointed out, how secure is the data that's being used? Um, uh, Apple said recently that they had basically a bug in their system, and they said that even when um, you had your phone off, in the background, even if you didn't have location on, 
information was being collected. They said that if you download a patch, that'll be taken care of. However, the information that's cached on your device is not encrypted. They said that when they do their next major update of their operating system, that information will be encrypted. So some members of Congress, Ed Markey and others, have said, okay, so you're making some progress, but there's a lot of these questions still, e even if a person get, gives consent and even if a person knows what it's being used for, how secure is the information? Because the other concern, as the Justice Department person pointed out, is hacking and cyber hacking. I mean, we haven't even talked about that. We've just talked about, okay, my information is, is being sold and I don't know about it. But the, basically, it's one big world of, of a PC and, an, uh, uh, and the mobile device now. It's one big internet, if you will. Um, so what does it say that this has been known, in a sense, for a while, and Congress is just kind of hearing about it? I mean, I think it's because apps are so big now. Because up until about five years ago, it was a voice world in mobile. I mean, most of the revenues were coming from, from voice. Now, basically, a third of the revenues are coming from data, and that's going to only increase. I mean, when you, your program and others have done things about spectrum crunches, part of the reason there's a spectrum crunch, according to the FCC and others, is because people are using all these data applications. Um, so I think it's because the, the app world, if you will, has exploded. I, mean, I think it was going to be inevitable, if you will, once these became so popular. And smartphones became so popular. It used to be smartphones were kind of, they were very expensive, and they were used, unless they were subsidized, even then they cost more, they were used by kind of the, the higher end market. Now, the projections show that more than half, well over half of people will have smartphones. And, you know, these days, almost everyone seems to have a smartphone. Senator Coburn is the ranking member on the uh, Judiciary Subcommittee on Privacy, Technology, and the Law, and here's part of his opening statement. I think we need to be very careful on this idea of, of security because the greatest example I know is we spend $64 billion a year on IT in the federal government, and then on the top of that, we spend tens of billions on security, and we're breached daily. So <clears throat> we should not be requesting a standard that we cannot even live up to at the federal government. So the concern is an accurate one, uh, but I think we're going to have to work on what that standard would be, uh, whether it's a good faith effort or something. But to, to say somebody's liable for a breach of their security when, when we all know <clears throat> you, almost every system in the, in the world can be breached today, uh, we need to be careful with how far we carry that. Yeah, and the reactions, he was talking to the Federal Trade Commission and Department of Justice representatives, and the reaction was, no one is saying it's perfect. No one says, unless you're perfect, um, basically you're going to be liable, because there's no perfection in, in the cyber world. But they said there has to be some standard where you have to take reasonable measures to protect the, the data. And then if you don't take those measures, then they're saying that there could be some sort of liability. Now, some others go farther. Senator Blumenthal was at the hearing, and he said, well, you, need, you should also have a private right of action. So even more than that. Now, Senator Coburn is known as being a real hawk on the budget, if you will, and fiscal and things like that. Um, so there might be some, some of that into it. He also said that hearing um, in his opening comment, which was interesting, he said, we need a whole lot more information and knowledge before we come to conclusions about what should or needs to be done. So he's a, he's a lot more hesitant, if you will, to say we need some legislation and we need it now, uh, unlike the Democrats on the panel. Is this a partisan issue then? Um, I would say that the Democrats are much more much more eager to to move forward. Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily partisan. I, I mean, there weren't other there were no other Republicans there, so it's not. Uh, and in the in the House, certainly. Um, both Republicans and Democrats have expressed concern. Uh, Joe Barton, who's on the House Energy and Commerce Committee, has, have expressed concerns about location-based data and how it's being collected. So I guess I would say, no, it's not partisan. I, I guess I'd say members of both parties are concerned about it. Do, are there future hearings on this issue scheduled? Um, I think there are. There, I think we can expect future hearings. I think uh, Senator Franken has not said when there will be a hearing, uh, you know, whether, whether he's going to have another hearing. Um, in the House, Energy and Commerce, there have been a lot of letters back and forth on the issues. I mean, I think we could probably expect hearings in both, both houses this year. Um, was there any talk, Paul Kirby, about the shape of any legislation that could come from this? Well, one of the, one of the issues is, and, and um, the other thing we're waiting for is the Obama administration is coming forth with a cyber plan. And the Department of Justice said at the hearing, and they said at another recent hearing, that that will involve, it will have location-based technology aspects to it. It will also have data breach notification aspects to it. It's, a, it's much broader than just location-based. Um, so there's that. 
Um, Senator Leahy mentioned he wants to update the Electronic Privacy Communications Act, uh, and he wants to do that in fairly short order. So, I mean, there are, there's, there's several things floating around, if you will, that can be expected. There are some, broad, some broader data breach uh, legislation that's been introduced um, that has been introduced in the past as well. Again, those are broader pieces, but um, certainly location-based and mobile could be part of those bills as well. Is there the mood in the Congress to pass this? You know, the problem with the mood is the, the mood is the deficit, the, and the mood is, is some of the partisan things going on between Congress and the White House and, and national security and things like that. Um, next year's an election year, so it's always hard, you know, as we get closer and closer. So uh, I don't really like to predict what they may do, but certainly it's, it's, a, it's definitely a hot topic. And finally, do you see a lot of pushback from the Apples and the Googles of the world? I mean, I think they're trying to point out, and don't forget, we also have the carriers. The carriers were sent letters by the House Energy and Commerce Committee saying, what are you doing and what's your role in this? And their response was, well, when, they, when, we, when we send the apps out, if we have something to do with the apps, we make sure there's consent. But guess what? We don't have control over all the, pe all the things people download onto their phones. So, um, so I guess there's pushback, but I think... I think some people realize, some of the companies realize that um, there, is, there is a need for some sort of framework any, anyway. One, one thing about the broader data breach legislation, um, there's laws in 40 states but no national framework. And of course some companies, when you have 40 state or 50 state laws, there's a concern that there's too many, too many laws to have to follow. So there are companies that have said, look, we need some sort of floor, if you will, some sort of a reasonable um, uh, framework. Um, so people will have confidence in the data that goes over the internet. Paul Kirby is a senior editor with Telecommunications Reports. Thank you for helping us to frame this phone tracking hearing that was held this week. By the way, if you want to watch the entire hearing, you can go to cspan.org and uh, search our video library. It's uh, readily available and you can watch it for free. Well, joining us now on the phone is Amy Schatz of the Wall Street Journal. She broke a story this week on Meredith Atwell Baker. Ms. Schatz, what was the story you broke? So Meredith Baker is leaving the FCC in June to join Comcast, Comcast's uh, D.C. office, to be senior vice president of government relations. And was this a surprise? It was a surprise. I think a lot of folks thought that... Um, she would be renominated for the agency. She'd only been there for two years, although she had been at NTIA for a number of years. But I think this was a surprise for folks. Now, were there any conflicts of interest in, in uh, the last couple of months that uh, people should be aware of? Well, four months ago, she did, uh, in fact, uh, vote for Comcast's uh, $13.75 billion um, deal to acquire NBC Universal. Uh, so that is something that is, is raising eyebrows around town, although it's, it's not illegal for her to go there. And obviously, uh, lobbying rules would be in place so she wouldn't be able to lobby the agency for a certain amount of time. Um, but this kind of uh, revolving door happens in D.C. a lot, and this is another example of it. So uh, Kyle McSlero, former head of the NCTA, is the uh, uh, chief of the uh, Comcast Washington Bureau, correct? And now they have Meredith Atwell Baker, two Republicans. Do they have any strong Democrats as well on their, on their, uh, in their staff here in Washington? They do. In fact, um, Comcast has hired um, a variety of, of folks along both parties. It's a very bipartisan office. Uh, Kathy Zackham, who's head of their their FCC um, regulatory office. She is a Democrat, and, and uh, they do have a number of Democrats that they've brought over from the agency, former staffers for commissioners and others. And so it's actually one of the offices in town which is really well, is known for being very bipartisan. So they have a good, good selection on both sides. Amy Schatz, can you tell us how you found out? Uh, I really can't. But they... <laughs> Oh, and who might be her replacement? Are there any uh, word? Is there any word out there yet? You know, that's going to be really interesting. No one had really been talking about her leaving, and so no one, no names have really been floated yet. Although I'm, I'm sure within days we will have plenty of people floating their names out there. Um, obviously, this is something that um, we already had a, a Democratic seat opening up with uh, Michael Copps leaving by the end of the year, and and obviously folks are already talking about Jessica Rosenworcel as being a possible replacement. She's a telecom counsel for uh, Senator Rockefeller. Uh, obviously, some other names are in the mix. Um, so this might actually be something that actually moves that nomination forward because you'd have uh, both a Republican and a Democratic seat uh, to fill. Amy Schatz of the Wall Street Journal, thanks for being on The Communicators. Thank you.